So I'll start about 3.01 then. In about two minutes. Okay, um, welcome everybody to uh, this Earth to Earth seminar. Um, it's sunny here in Nottingham. I hope it's sunny where you are. Um, we have a great talk coming up. I just want to say a few words before we start with uh, Isabel and Sophia. So uh, thanks again for joining. Uh, if you just to remind you, the Earth to Earth initiative is to engage UK geosciences uh, with inspiring science from internationally leading researchers uh, to promote inclusivity and diversity, and also to support early career researchers. So we, we try very hard to, to pair up senior academics with, uh, with early career researchers and highlight geoscientists contributions to global environmental challenges. It's open to all UK institutions to, to participate. They take place about every two weeks. Um, at this time and this day, they're open to everyone. You can join via Zoom, or you can also join by the live, live stream on YouTube. Uh, just a reminder that the lecture today will be recorded um, with speaker's permission and will be available on YouTube uh, with closed captioning. There's more information on other talks um, on the uh, Earth to Earth uh, website, and you can see it on the calendar. During the seminars, please follow our code of contact, uh, conduct, which you can see on the Earth to Earth webpage. If you want to ask questions, uh, please use the Q&A channel at the bottom of your Zoom uh, window. You can post questions at any time during the seminar. Um, anyone can vote up questions that they like. We'll have 10, mini 10 minutes at the end uh, for me to relay your questions to the speakers. So um, I'll try and get an interesting array of questions for the speakers. So it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce uh, today's speakers. So we have Isabel Montañez, who's a very well-known field geologist and geochemist who's uh, got research interests in the sedimentary record of coupled physical and chemical variation in paleo oceans, global biogeochemical cycling in marine and terrestrial records, and carbonate fluid rock interaction in sedimentary basins using stratigraphy, petrography, and geochemistry. She also uses stable and radiogenic, radiogenic isotopes and trace elements. And we also have uh, Sofia Makarovic, who's a climate modeler and a PhD candidate working at the University of Michigan under uh, Dr. Chris Poulsen. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to Isabel uh, for the talk today. Thanks very much. Great, thank you. All right, my slides are up? Yep. Yep, great, great. thank you for that introduction. Uh, and as you've said, I'm, I'm Isabel Montañez uh, from UC Davis. And uh, as uh, Michael's already said, my partner in this talk is uh, Sophie Makarowicz from University of Michigan. And we've been working together uh, for the past five years. So what we'd like to do today is to share with you a, a reconstruction of the penultimate ice house from an earth system perspective uh, that is a reflection of the collective works of our two research groups. And we hope that we can illustrate that putting together an Earth system perspective for something 300 million years ago is now possible because of advances in uh, proxy approaches, in radioisotopic dating, and uh, in modeling tools. <clears throat> 
Let me, sorry, I'm getting cursor going. So I just wrap, quickly want to say that what, we are the two presenters, um, but this what we're presenting is the collective intellectual contributions of a lot of people. And we'd like to highlight in particular these four, uh, John Ritchie and Joseph White from Baylor University, Chris, as uh, Michael uh, I already mentioned, from um, who is a climate modeler at University of Michigan, and Zhitao Chen, uh, who is at the Nanjing Institute of uh, Geological and Paleontological Sciences. Their contributions are, are to this pr particular presentation um, are pretty, pretty broad. So when we speak about a earth system perspective or an whole earth reconstruction, you know, we're, we're focusing on the study of this planet as an interacting set of complex subsystems that drive planetary function. And the point here is that using this approach, uh, one that, inter that, that focuses on the interactions and feedbacks rather than the specific processes will provide a more holistic and dynamic perspective than you might obtain from um, uh, more di traditional disciplinary approaches. And a systems approach is now transferable to the very deep time. Um, today, we're talking about something 300 million years ago. And I, I would argue this is the case because we can now develop uh, very accurate and precise chronostratigraphic frameworks thanks to the uh, advances in high precision radioisotope dating and the potential for astronomical calibration. So being able to develop these time calibrated and increasingly higher resolution stratigraphic frameworks permits us to evaluate proxy data in terms of trends in time and space. And a really critical component of this work, and I think Sophie uh, deserves an enormous amount of, of uh, credit here, is the ability um, to, to use modeling to synthesize and conceptualize the observations from the proxy records, and then to link them mechanistically to processes. So we hope that we're going to be able to, to give you, um, to share with you some of the uh, approaches that we, of these approaches and uh, to do this. Now, um, this diagram uh, is, it, it really illustrates the importance of studying deep time Earth systems in time periods well beyond that of the current glacial state, um, including time periods where there was widespread continental ice, but that underwent uh, full deglaciations. And we call this a landscape a stability diagram. You see the Earth here as it exits the uh, trough of the glacial interglacial conditions and enters the deepening Anthropocene, Anthropocene basin. And the gray arrow is the human driven trajectory to date and two projected trajectories for the future. And I think we all appreciate that the earth is currently on the one on the right, um, that hot house earth trajectory. As we approach perhaps too quickly, that 1.5 to 2 degrees of warming, which is the planetary threshold we want to avoid. So relevant to this talk, um, the late Paleozoic, uh, 300 million years ago, Ice House went out, had a complete turnover to greenhouse conditions that lasted for over 200 million years. And despite very different boundary conditions, uh, this is the only example we have of a vegetated Earth with meso metazoan life that has crossed this planetary threshold. All right, we're dialing back. We're 300 million years back, um, the late Paleozoic that is represented uh, primarily by about 50 million years of the Carboniferous and the Permian. So on this diagram, you see um, atmospheric composition and very similar to today, CO2 was generally low but oxygen was quite a bit higher, as high as 26%, maybe even 30%. And what's important to this Earth system perspective here is that the oxygen to CO2 ratio uh, was perhaps the highest in Earth history, and certainly at least two, three times that of present day. And this had to impact uh, the biosphere. And on the right, you see a paleogeographic reconstruction uh, illustrating the widespread continental glaciation in the southern latitudes, high latitudes. And the color bands, in particular the green and the uh, blue, are the distribution of the tropical forest or forest biomes. And these at some point covered 33% of the, of the Pangean surface. <clears throat> 
Now we know from a rich paleobotanical record that these biomes arch archive repeated restructuring or turnovers that were in step with climate and that we will argue um, here undoubtedly fed back on atmospheric CO2 and on the climate. So to introduce our approach to developing this late Paleo this Earth system perspective or whole Earth perspective for the late Paleozoic uh, Ice Age, we're going to uh, walk through this diagram. So there are one of the key components. Um, we've been looking at about a dozen basins at both Paleo high latitudes and low latitudes, and a key component is being able to calibrate the stratigraphic or chronostratigraphic frameworks where possible with high precision uh, uranium lead dates. And then that permits us to develop proxy records, uh, both from the terrestrial and the marine realm. Uh, so we can reconstruct paleo CO2 and environmental uh, seawater and climate conditions for those different basins. In the high latitudes, we've been focusing on uh, the Southern African and South American basins to look at um, extent and timing of the continental glaciers through the, the ice age. And for the biosphere, uh, our work has focused on using fossil, really well-preserved fossil plant material, applying that to process-based ecosystem models. So we can try to to uh, evaluate the functioning of these extinct plants and then how they may have interacted back on uh, carbon and water cycling. And, and although Sophie won't be talking about this today, she has been quite involved in this, doing some really interesting work with an earth system model. Uh, so that brings up this, a critical component is the use of these earth system models to uh, permit us to, to evaluate the mechanistic linkages between all of these processes, and then also to conceptualize the collective data sets. So today we're gonna uh, highlight three, three of these um, areas. First, I'll present uh, our paleo CO2 estimates and it's linked to some of the other components. Then I'll turn to uh, the tropical vegetation, what we've learned about its ecophysiological functioning, and, and then the interaction with CO2 in the climate. Sophie will then um, present her work with a water isotope enabled uh, Earth system model, CESM 1.2, and her ability to uh, simulate ocean conditions uh, in the glacial interglacial oceans from the epicontinental to global scale. So we're going to start with the atmosphere. Uh, our CO2 our approach to developing CO2 has been a multi-proxy um, one where we use soil minerals such as the carbonate uh, rhizolith you see here forming around a complex paleo root system uh, in a soil like the one you see on the left. And we take the carbon isotopes of the calcite and the occluded organic matter within that rhizolith and some other soil parameters apply it to a Monte Carlo based uh, inverse model to, to estimate CO2. Now, I think we all appreciate the uncertainties with these approaches can be quite high. So this is the, why we take this multi proxy approach. And so we complement this with two fossil plant approaches. Both use fossil cuticles like the one you see here. And the first, um, it's been shown that the frequency of the stomata or breathing pores, these uh, white daisy-like patterns here, the frequency of those stomata uh, have an inverse relationship with atmospheric CO2. And that's the basis behind the stomatal index approach. And I'm happy to talk about any of the issues re related to these in, during the questions, if there are any. Um, given that there are limitations, we've taken yet another approach, which is more of a mechanistic model uh, that's based on the, the universal gas leaf exchange equation. And you can see how that um, translates here in this equation. CO2 is related to three input parameters that we can primarily get either directly from the cuticle uh, or from the ecosystem modeling. So you're gonna see this diagram several times and Sophie will use it as well. And I just wanna point out the time scale. It'll be about 315 million years to about 270 million years. And what you're looking at here is a 40 million year reconstruction of CO2 that we recently published. Uh, and it does integrate and modernize all of the CO2 
our, our estimates that uh, my group has put together since about 2005. It also includes several interglacial flora for the Pennsylvanian and uh, several Permian flora. So let me walk you through what you're looking at. Um, black are the best estimates um, for any particular uh, interval, and they are based on multiple analyses. And you see a lot of variability. And I, I do want to point out that that variability is in large part due not to error, but to the more uh, the, the tens, the hundreds of thousands of year fluctuations. And here you're seeing a seven million year interval of one of this this part of the Pennsylvanian, and it shows this glacial interglacial variability uh, from about 200, 300 parts per million to 550, 650, and even as high as 700 parts per million. Now, the lowest trend lines on the diagram on the left are um, based on bootstrapping, uh, where we have integrated both uh, the age uncertainty as well as the CO2 uncertainties. And the colors are to help guide your eye. Uh, in shades of blue are increments of 100 ppm below the long-term average of 400 parts per million. And in orange uh, are values above that. So if you use the colors to guide your eye, you'll see that the, the uh, first part of the record, the last 12 million years of the Carboniferous show a long-term uh, fall. Then there's this uh, newly re recognized sort of CO2 nadir of the first 10 million years of the early Permian, and then arise the next uh, 17 million years, final finishing at about 760 parts per million, plus or minus uh, 60 parts per million. Now, visually, um, the, the CO2 values uh, primarily fall under the modeled Again, ESM modeled uh, uh, ice sheet th a threshold for the initiation of continental ice sheets. That's 560 parts per million. You'll see that varies actually, but generally 560 parts per million. Uh, and that the uh, trends in CO2 correspond fairly well with that of the uh, geographic extent of glacial deposits shown here by these turquoise uh, boxes per uh, stage. Uh, including the maximum ice during that CO2 nadir and the near complete loss of ice at 290 million years when you start the rise, uh, that 17 million year rise. Uh, it has been previously suggested that that fall through the Carboniferous is related to the uplift and denudation um, of the central Pangaean mountains. These were mountains that spanned about 10,000 kilometers of the tropics or probably somewhere between 2,000 and 4,000 meters high. And the idea here, of course, is that enhanced silicate weathering would have increased uh, CO2 consumption. Um, the uh, issue here, however, um, is that there, or a paradox that is raised, is that the denudation rates of the Central Pantheon Mountains have waned by the time you get to this CO2 nadir. In addition, the burial of organic carbon um, in peats or in swampy environments and ultimately as coal is also disappears by the end of the Pennsylvanian with the demise of the wetland forests due to intensifying aridification. So what is the source of this CO2 nadir? And similarly, um, the rise in the CO2 out of the nadir corresponds visually well with the, uh, the onset of geographically extensive and expansive magmatism shown by these yellow boxes. Uh, but another paradox is raised um, because after the uh, release of CO2 by these magmatic events, if those mafic minerals were exposed as outcrop in the tropics, they in fact would have become a much longer term CO2 sink. So we wanted to interrogate these two paradoxes and um, to get a better sense of the relative roles of the CO2 sinks and sources. And so to do so, um, we used a spatially resolved intermediate complexity uh, model that uh, models steady state CO2, that's what you're going to see on the vertical axis, in response to changes in weathering and to climate. So I'll walk you through what we're looking at. Um, Pennsylvanian in blue, that CO2 nadir will always be the gray shading. The different color symbols and lines, those are the C modeled 
uh, steady state atmospheric CO2 for different scenarios. So the first is the blue one. That is modeled for a Himalayan uh, type mountain range where 70% of the alkalinity that is produced is due to weathering of felsic rock assemblages or granites. And we call that the baseline continental rock assemblage. So if we look at that in the Pennsylvanian here on the, on the left, it keeps CO2 below the modeled ice threshold. But when you get to that CO2 nadir, it rapidly exceeds the, the threshold. Now, the other three are for increasing percentages of mafic minerals that are outcropping, or mafic rocks, outcropping and available for weathering. Orange is the twofold increase. For the Pennsylvanian, that gives us snowball earth levels of CO2, which is not reasonable. And it too exceeds that ice threshold. The green and the blue, I mean, the green and the red are for three and fourfold increase in mafic minerals available for, for weathering. And um, they are in, the only ones in that CO2 nadir that maintain CO2 at or below the ice threshold. And so the implications here are that uh, that magmatism may have been a short-term source of CO2, but must have been acting as a longer-term sink through the early part of the Permian and that CO2 nadir. So the same model produces strontium isotopic compositions of seawater, and here you're seeing the uh, model trends uh, superimposed on the proxy values. And for the Pennsylvanian, um, the, the general good overlap certainly supports this notion of uplift of the central Pentian mountains as and their weathering as the source of CO2 uh, consumption and a, a strong signal on seawater strontium. But after 303, when you see this linear fall uh, in the proxies and, and all four cap models capture that, um, it, the interesting thing is the best fit through that CO2 nadir is a progressively increasing of the amount of mafic minerals that were being weathered. And so we interpret this as there being a major shift in the tropics and the weatherability across that Carboniferous Permian boundary, and that that was driven by a progressive increase in the ratio of mafic to granite um, minerals or rocks available for weathering. And that kind of counterintuitively to what you might think if you just visually look at the CO2 trends relative to other uh, parameters, that the CO2 nadir was probably sustained by the weathering of these mafic rocks until it, that, so, that sink was uh, outpaced by magmatic source. So now I'm going to turn um, briefly to the uh, biosphere, just to highlight a little bit of what we do. And I'll, I'll look at how the changes in the atmospheric CO2 uh, affected the functioning of these extinct plants, where their physiological um, or where their environmental thresholds for their physiological viability. And then what was their, the impact of this response to the plants to climate change on water cycling? Now this timeline um, shows the, uh, is illustrating this repeated changes in the uh, tropical forests that involve quantitative changes in species composition and vegetational architecture. And this is illustrated visually um, by these dioramas up here in the top and by the shades of green on the, on the timeline and for the wetland forests and in orange for the more uh, seasonally uh, dry adapted uh, biomes. And the point is, is that this restructuring or turnover in vegetation occurred in step with climate. That's long been known over a hierarchy of timescales. You can see from the shading, it's the million year time scale, And then those short bars, that's the interglacial, glacial, hundreds of thousand year time scale. So we wanted to better understand what, is the, what are the processes behind these repeated turnovers and, and in response to changes in O2 and CO2 and the paleometeorological conditions, again, coming out of Chris Poulsen's lab. And so we used a process-based ecosystem model called Biome BGC. And we have adapted this model um, to be able to uh, 
to uh, input plant specific traits from extinct plants. And that, that's gonna be these green rhomboids that we input to the model. And of course, the, to, to be able to input the modeled paleometeorology. And also to um, be able to evaluate the capacity of these extinct plants to environmental change. And we call this adapted model paleo BGC. So I mentioned that we inputs uh, from the fossil plant material uh, is these green rhomboids. And I'll speak to those uh, in a minute. I did want to point out that there are um, multiple dominant plant groups during this time in the paleotropical forests. There's those iconic lycopsids that I think we all know about. Uh, Medullosans were the first seed plants. They look like ferns, but they're actually seed plants. And together, they were your, your dominant uh, wetland, true swampy environment dominant groups. And then there are the more, uh, the plants adapted to temporarily to uh, even permanent drought, like the cordatalians, the oaks of the Paleozoic, the uh, tree ferns, and then uh, different kinds of uh, conifers. So we call these plant functional types, these dominant plant groups, and that's what we model. We can, uh, from each of those, where there is well, uh, really well-preserved fossil plant matter, like this medullosan example on the right, we can actually measure quite a few of these specific plant traits right from the material. And this is a, a few of the things that we can measure. So to give you a better example, here's a cuticle. Uh, of a medullosan, and we can look at the size and frequency of these stomata and get at the maximum stomatal conductance. And that gives us Gmax. Um, if we couple that with yet another measurement, a cross section of the medullosan, for example, we can measure the vein to stomata distance, gives us mesophyll path length, and that's what we call DM. Together, those will tell us the plant's ability to resupply water to the leaf, that the water that has been lost by evapotranspiration and thus their drought tolerance. Similarly, we can take the uh, carbon to nitrogen ratios of these plant groups shown here distributed by some of the different groups. And I'll point out that their C to N ratios are not that different than their modern day equivalents. So that'll inform uh, C to N foliar uh, values. And uh, from that, we can, um, with the other parameters, we can model things like, well, evapotranspiration rate, soil water, soil water discharge, leaf area index, photosynthesis and growth rate, carbon allocation, and the nitrogen budget. So I'm going to show you briefly um, uh, just a, a few results um, to illustrate the kind of things we can do, and then I'll turn it over to Sophie. So this is a plot on the vertical axis of daily leaf water potential. Think of that as a uh, plant's drought tolerance. And it is modeled for four of the plant dominant groups for a modeled year, an average of 50 years. So in green are the lycopsids, uh, and you can see that they have the lowest leaf water potential. In black and in blue are the more um, drought tolerant, uh, cordatalians and tree ferns. And the point of, uh, when the medullosans salt for bombs fall somewhere in between, depending on which medullosan we model. Uh, but the point here is that for the lycopsids in green, they have a much, they, they have many more days of the year where their leaf water potential is actually below the wilting point. And that translates to two months of, of um, per year of lower growing season or lower productivity. And then the same uh, results produce um, soil water content for the same input environmental conditions. And you can see that much lower soil water content for the lycopsids in green, uh, and that this reflects their high water usage relative to the other plants. So this means that, for example, a very small change in effective moisture in, at a site would be deadly for the lycopsids, whereas the others would be opportunistic, right, ecophysiologically adapted to that change. And then uh, lastly, from that same environmental conditions and same runs, we can pull out average daily surface runoff or uh, surface water well, discharge. And for those uh, dry, uh, drought tolerant plants, the uh, tree ferns and the cordatalians, 
Um, they have a much higher uh, surface runoff for the same conditions relative to those lycopsids. And again, it relates to those previous diagrams. But what does this mean in terms of uh, feedbacks? Well, here is a map of the modern day Congo River watershed. And I'm gonna use this to illustrate how these differences in surface water discharge due to the, the differences in the functioning of these plants would translate in terms of water yield. So if the watershed, the, the Congo River watershed were dominated by lycopsids, it would be half as much water discharge uh, annually. If it was dominated by tree ferns, it would be four times as much. So what about through time, through this ice house and its demise? Well, the mid-carboniferous was dominated by the lycopsids with their low surface water discharge. By the late carboniferous, the dominance was in the tropics was by these uh, cordotalians and tree ferns. And ultimately by the turnover into the early Permian, it was cordotalian and um, conifer dominance. So this translates through time to a potential sevenfold increase in surface runoff. And if the tropics, uh, when we think about the extent of these forests, this would have a whole earth uh, impact. It would yield uh, a much increased surface erosion and sediment yield, nutrient loading and to fresh water and coastal waterways, and ultimately would have to impact organic carbon burial in those coastal waterways uh, and in the ocean. So uh, what we infer from this then is that CO2 nadir that um, was hard to explain initially by the, uh, the sort of first order um, sinks for, the, for the, uh, the time period. Well, here's another source for that nadir because a major shift in locus of the organic carbon burial from land in the Pennsylvanian to sea in the earliest Permian uh, may have in fact offered this additional uh, sink for that say, nadir, despite intensifying aridification and demise of those forests and denudation of the highlands. All right, I will pass the screen to Sophie. Okay, thank you. Can everyone see my slides here? Okay, great. Okay, good. So the next component of our approach to reconstructing the late Paleozoic Earth system involves the hydrosphere. I'm going to go over two scales in the ocean, including glacial interglacial changes and global scale thermohaline circulation, and then to the regional scale with the use of epicontinental seas as indicators of nearby open ocean conditions. So the primary tool I use to study the late Paleozoic Earth system is an Earth system model. Many different versions of these models have been developed and refined by scientists across the world, but every Earth system model starts um, with mathematical representations of physical, chemical, and biological processes and fluid dynamics that are able to represent the dominant large-scale processes of the atmosphere, ocean, and land. These equations are then converted into computer code that can be solved over a global grid. Typically, this translates to about two to three million lines of code or 18,000 pages of printed text, depending on the configuration of the model. And so in order to solve this giant amount of code as a function of time, we use a supercomputer the size of a tennis court to run it. And then finally, the fun part is the output, which is terabytes of data representing climate estimates like temperature, rainfall, wind patterns, sea ice formation, and many more. Um, as Earth system models were originally designed to help us understand how the Earth system will respond to increasing levels of greenhouse gases in the future. So in order to apply Earth system models to the distant past, we use essentially the same understanding of physical and chemical processes. However, the uh, boundary conditions and parameters of the model, such as the continental distribution, greenhouse gases, sea level, and topography um, are, are changed using geologic archives. So the combination of these two aspects creates a robust tool because now we can constrain the physical mechanism responsible for proxy inferred climate patterns and update paleoclimate simulations based on new advances in geologic archives. So paleoclimate modeling is an iterative process in this way. <clears throat> 
The Earth System model that I use is the Community Earth System Model from the National Center for Atmospheric Research. And today I'm going to show you results from two simulations that are intended to represent mean glacial and interglacial conditions during the late Pennsylvanian. Both of these simulations have a fully coupled configuration, meaning that the atmosphere, land, and ocean components are fully active. And they have about the same resolution of one degree latitude by longitude in the ocean and two degrees latitude by longitude in the atmosphere and the land components. They've both been run for 2,500 years. And each case is based on a late Pennsylvanian paleogeography from about 300 million years ago. Um, both cases have reduced solar luminosity by 2.5% less relative to modern. And so the main differences between the two cases are the sea level, land ice, and atmospheric CO2. The glacial case on the top here has relatively lower uh, sea level, you can see here, and expanded high latitude ice sheets over Gondwana, which you can see in these crosshatched areas. It also has relatively lower CO2 of 280 ppm. And then in the interglacial case, there's relatively higher sea level, um, reduced land ice, and then relatively higher CO2 of 560 ppm. So um, altogether, these two simulations test the influence of atmospheric CO2, sea level, and land ice on late Pennsylvanian climate. So the first question that can be addressed with these glacial and interglacial simulations is how did CO2 fluctuations impact dissolved oxygen in the ocean? Over the Kazimovian Gazellian boundary, or KGB, about 304 million years ago, there was an abrupt rise in atmospheric CO2 from about 350 to 700 ppm over about 300,000 years. And so this rise in CO2 also coincides with a temperature increase, a sea level rise, and a loss of marine biodiversity. During the KGB, there are two major ocean basins. So the first is the Paleotepes that sits in between Pangaea and these China blocks over here. And then the second is the Panthalassic Ocean, which covers an entire hemisphere of the Earth. Here is South China. And so these are the locations of the two records um, from open water carbonate slope successions. Um, which is led by Zhitao Chen, and Isabel and I also contributed to this work. So I'm just showing you one of those proxy records um, here from South China, and they show paired uranium and carbon, carbon isotope records that support a major carbon cycle perturbation coupled with ocean deoxygenation. So there are negative excursions in uranium and carbon isotopes. If you're unfamiliar with uranium isotopes as a proxy for ocean deoxygenation, uranium isotopes are used to reconstruct redox conditions in the ocean. So under low uh, oxygen conditions, the dominant 238U isotope is removed from ambient seawater to anoxic sediments, leaving seawater enriched in 235U. So negative excursions in delta 238U coincide with periods of expanded marine anoxia. And without getting into the details of this work, coupled carbon cycle modeling and uranium mass balance modeling support a 9,000 gigaton injection of carbon over 300,000 years and a 24% increase in anoxic C4 area during this time. My glacial and interglacial simulations can be used to constrain the physical mechanisms responsible for this inferred pattern in ocean deoxygenation with warming. So first, my simulations indicate that CO2-induced warming enhances upper ocean stratification in the Paleotethes and Panthalassic oceans. Here are a set of panels um, with the glacial case on the top and the interglacial case on the bottom. These are latitude versus depth plots of temperature and density in the Panthalassic ocean. In the glacial ocean, we can see relatively thicker layers of equal density as well as temperature in the top 500 meters of the ocean. And so these um, both become thinner in the interglacial case, indicating that warming causes a strengthening of the surface halocline, which occurs from increased precipitation over the ocean and a shallowing of the thermocline, 
So both of these impacts uh, act to inhibit convection and ventilation in the surface ocean. The second potential mechanism um, is a halting of deep water formation in the northern Panthalassic Ocean with warming. So this figure shows the climatological maximum mixed layer depth or the maximum mixed layer depth for each ocean grid box across the entire year. So in general, we can see more shallow mixed layers in the uh, interglacial case compared to the glacial. And in the high latitudes, the maximum mixed layer depth occurs during the cooler winter and spring months. And so this is associated with deep water formation in these regions. In the glacial case, deep water formation only uh, occurs in uh, both hemispheres, as you can see here, whereas in the interglacial case, deep water formation only occurs in the southern hemisphere. So this difference in deep convection creates a reorganization of meridional overturning circulation in the Panthalassic Ocean. In these plots, I'm showing meridional uh, overturning circulation, which is the zonally integrated component of surface and deep currents in the ocean. Negative values correspond to counterclockwise circulation and positive values correspond to clockwise circulation. So these arrows are showing you the dominant directions of circulation. There are descending branches in both Southern hemispheres in the interglacial case, this descending branch in the southern hemisphere forms one sort of large overturning cell in the Panthalassic Ocean. Whereas in the glacial case, there's also a descending branch in the northern hemisphere. And so this sort of creates a relatively weaker overturning in the northern hemisphere. And this seems to suggest that the deep waters in the northern Panthalassic Ocean of the interglacial case are poorly ventilated compared to the glacial. So to show you why this happens, I'm showing you polar plots of the Northern Hemisphere. So the center of the plot is the North Pole. So the left panel shows sea surface temperatures and the right shows sea ice formation. So in the uh, glacial case, we can see relatively cool sea surface temperatures that support the formation of a large mass of sea ice that extends southward to about 60 degrees latitude. Whereas in the interglacial case, um, the sea surface temperatures are too warm to allow for the formation of sea ice. And so there no sea ice forms in the Northern Hemisphere. The result of this is that the formation of that sea ice in the glacial case um, lowers the, the uh, or increases the sea surface salinity of the glacial case and reduces surface buoyancy. And so that allows for the initiation of deep water formation. Whereas in the interglacial case, um, sea surface salinities remain relatively low and the surface buoyancy is too high to initiate that deep water formation. So taken together, the combination of increased surface stratification and absence of deep convection in the Northern Hemisphere with warming reduces ventilation in the ocean. So these plots show um, the depth versus latitude of the ideal age tracer in the Panthalassic Ocean. Ideal age in CESM tracks the time since a water mass has been in contact with the surface. So a young age means that the water is well ventilated and an old age means that the water is uh, poorly ventilated. In the glacial case, we can clearly see relatively young waters in both polar regions. Whereas in the interglacial case, the freshening of that uh, surface water in the Northern hemisphere um, reduces any ventilation of those deep waters in the Northern Panthalassic Ocean. So those, those waters are poorly ventilated. And previous climate modeling studies have shown that old ideal age in the model typically correlates with low dissolved oxygen in the deep ocean. Um, that said, other biological, some biological factors like oxygen utilization rate influence dissolved oxygen in the ocean and are not represented in these simulations. So further work is warranted. But now that we've covered that first global scale question of thermohaline circulation, I'd like to uh, move to the regional scale with epicontinental seas or shallow inland seas.
as these environments are critical for reconstructing global ocean conditions in deep time and address the question, to what extent do ancient epicontinental isotopic records reflect the chemistry of the bordering ocean? The reason why epicontinental environments are so important in deep time is that the oldest oceanic crust on Earth today is about 200 million years old. So deep ocean sediments from before this time virtually do not exist. This means that epicontinental records from these light blue regions are the only source of geologic information we have to reconstruct ocean chemistry in the past. So the North American Mid-Continent Sea, or NAMS, situated over the equator, is a very large source of proxy records for the Pennsylvanian. In the North American Mid-Continent Sea, Previous studies have documented a west to east or offshore to onshore decrease in mollusk, brachiopod, and conodont values of delta 18O. And in order to understand what regions of the sea can be used as a proxy for nearby ocean conditions, it's critical to understand the environmental conditions responsible for this observed pattern in a fossil delta 18O. So the question is, does this offshore to onshore decrease in delta 18O reflect increasing temperatures, decreasing seawater delta 18O, or a combination of those factors? Um, paleoclimate modeling can help us address this question. So one component of these simulations that we've not looked at yet is the water isotope tracers. In addition to the physical, chemical, and biological processes in the model, we can also look at global variations in the stable isotopic ratios of water in the atmosphere, land, ocean, and sea ice. So this way we can directly compare simulated seawater delta 18O um, with marine fossil delta 18O instead of using an indirect um, model variable like salinity and temperature. So here is a map of global seawater delta 18O at the surface in the interglacial simulation. For reference, isotopic records from the South China region motivated the first component of the talk. And here we can see that the coastal open slope environment of South China has seawater delta 18 o values that are similar to the nearby open ocean. On the other hand, the North American mid-continent sea has coastal seawater delta 18 o values that are um, you know, up, to up to negative three per mil less than the nearby open ocean. So this is caused by the presence of uh, these high uh, equatorial mountains that cause high amounts of orographic precipitation and runoff into the sea. Also, the shape of the sea um, causes semi-restricted circulation. And these are the main basins across the sea that host the proxy records. And so I'll be using the names of these basins um, in all the following figures to show you uh, regions across the sea. So taking a closer look at seawater conditions in the North American Mid-Continent Sea, this is seawater uh, delta 18O, temperature and current vectors with depth across the major basins in the sea from west to east or offshore to onshore. The highest amount of runoff enters the eastern edge of the sea and drives offshore to onshore values of decreasing seawater delta 18O. Runoff also drives um, estuarine-like circulation pattern with the surface current that moves offshore um, and there's relatively constant surface temperature. In addition, there's upwelled waters um, offshore of the continental shelf um, that are pulled um, across the shelf at depth because of this circulation pattern. And so by defining the, the seawater delta 18 o and temperature of these basins across the sea, we can constrain the contribution of spatial variations in these seawater conditions to those proxy records in the sea using delta 18 o paleothermometry. And I'll show you how this generally works. So, in this case, I'm going to use conodont delta 18 o to compare with surface temperature. Um, as these are more free swimming organisms, and then brachiopod and mollusk delta 18O for bottom temperatures, as these are stationary organisms. And in order to calculate a paleo temperature 
using biogenic calcite, aragonite, or apatite delta 18 you need an estimate of ambient seawater delta 18 at the time of formation. So typically there is no way to determine this from oxygen isotopes alone. So traditionally it is assumed that ambient uh, seawater delta h note in the epicontinental sea is very similar to an open ocean value. And so here we assume this to be the case in these black markers where we use a constant uh, seawater delta h note value of negative 0.5 per mil to calculate paleo temperature across the sea. And this assumption produces increasing paleo temperatures of up to 45 degrees Celsius which is around the lethal limit of most modern marine organisms. And importantly, when we compare these paleo temperature estimates with the simulated um, surface temperature and the bottom uh, temperatures from the simulations, these are shown with these shaded blue regions, we see overall cooler and less variable temperatures produced by the Earth system model. So, the alternative now is that we can use our simulated seawater delta 18 values from each of these basins to recalculate these paleo temperatures shown in these blue markers. So here we can see that these paleo temperature estimates are cooler and overall are closer to those simulated temperature values, particularly in these more onshore regions where the influence of runoff is greater. In the more offshore regions like the Midland or Mid-Continent Basin, the uh, delta 18 values largely reflect seawater delta 18 of the nearby open ocean. And thus, uh, they, they may be more reliable in terms of reconstructing broader ocean conditions. And so finally, ancient uh, epicontinental isotopic records can be subject to the influence of coastal processes like runoff that can potentially decouple them from broader ocean chemistry, but Earth system models can be used to constrain these processes, particularly when these models contain isotope tracers. And so I hope that we've been able to demonstrate the unique insight that is gleaned from taking a systems approach to studying deep time, earth in, uh, deep time intervals of Earth history and we're happy to take any questions that you may have. Uh, great, thank you very much, Sophia and Isabel. Great talk, really uh, inspiring and interesting. Um, we have a couple of questions, so please encourage everybody to get typing to ask questions, uh, but I'll, I'll start off with these two. Oh, we have an, a third one, so things are mounting up quickly. So we'll start with the, the first question, um, all anonymous. Uh, I don't know if it's the same anonymous person. <laughs> Um, but this, this anonymous person has said, does the carbon isotope uh, record across the early Permian PCO2 Nandia support changes in organic carbon burial and could changes in biological productivity and thereby carbon burial also be being driven by volcanism and nutrient supply? I think this one is mine. I, I see the other two and I, I think those are for Sophie. Um, so the answer is uh, yes and no. Uh, the carbon isotopes do reach their peak um, which is in, in part why the oxygen, modeled oxygen values are so high right there in the earliest Permian. And it, and it depends on the model uh, that you're looking at, but um, by others. But I'm, the, the interesting thing is that, uh, well, two, one, I'm not sure we would be able to tell whether the organic carbon burial that we would see as a positive carbon isotope value, um, whether it was land or or ocean-based. I'm not sure we would necessarily see that as the values wouldn't be that different. Uh, but it, the interesting thing is, is that the burial um, terms of peat and coal do disappear before the end of the Carboniferous. So that peak in carbon isotopes in the records has always been sort of a, 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 a conundrum as to how do you get these highest values? So it would support a shift to the ocean. And then, yes, I you're, the, completely agree that uh, biological productivity would presumably change from the nutrients associated with all the volcanism and the surface runoff. And, and that was sort of part of what we were apply, implying with the uh, feedback diagram that with more nutrients to the ocean, and then of course falling into the, to the, to the waterways from volcanism, you would presumably also get higher productivity leading to that organic carbon burial, especially if you have uh, anoxia in parts of the ocean. 
Great, thanks. Sophia, do you want to have a go at the next two questions? I assume you can see them. Yes. Do you, so, want, to read, do you want to read them out so that people can... Uh... Yeah, the... Um, oh, did you say, do you want to read them out? Or well, I, I'll read them out if you like. Oh, so, okay. how sensitive is ocean circulation to the location and height of volcanic mid-ocean ridges? Are these well enough constrained to allow the modeling to be accurate? And the second question, can the Earth system model also predict oxygen triple, triple yeah. isotope composition observations of which might be able to constrain rainwater input? Um, yes, yeah. so the first question is referring to the fact that in these simulations, deep time ocean simulations, we have very little bathymetry included in them because we simply can't constrain um, deep ocean bathymetry from these time intervals. And I think, I think the, the answer that I'm drawn to is that, of course, um, it matters in terms of this finer scale circulation in the ocean. It's very important. But I still think it's a useful exercise to try to constrain large scale ocean circulation, even if we don't have that, that information. I think, um, and, and so I, I would say, uh, it's important, but also valuable insights can be gained with caution for deep time intervals in terms of ocean circulation. And the, the investigation is still worth it, but of course the bathymetry is important. Sophie, do you want to mention though, uh, where those um, mid-oceanic ridge lines come from? Uh, you know, the source mm -hmm. that was used to put them in there, because I think right. a lot of advances have been made actually in terms of the understanding the geodynamics of these, mm -hmm. of, of that time period. There, yeah, so, oh yeah, and in that component of the volcanic mid-ocean ridges, I use a, a program for this particular paleogeographic reconstruction, I use a program called G-plates, and that program can give you those, those ridge, those sort of ridges in the center of the ocean, and so the bathymetry we do use is that basic mid-ocean ridge system from the G-plate software. Mm -hmm. And then let's see. The, so the oxygen triple, triple isotope composition. In, in the system we wish. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, the the, <laughs> the answer is that they are incorporated in the model. If you wanted to, uh, it has all of the natural variations of That's those true. different isotopes inside the CESM. We can't constrain whether or not those values are reasonable uh, right now, but they are contained in the model. And so modern investigations. Right, we'll start looking at them. Mm -hmm. I, I think since I'm chairing, I'm going to ask a question myself very quickly. We've got a couple coming in, but my, my question is, as a biostratigrapher who's worked in the Permian and the Carboniferous, particularly Gondwana basins, it's notoriously difficult to correlate from one Gondwana basin to another in the late Carboniferous and early Permian, so in the Acelian or the Sakmarian, because in Gondwana basins, you are a cold water fauna, you don't have conodonts, you have maybe a few brachiopods, you mostly have palynology. And I'm presuming that you're using kind of correlations between basins to compare like with like. So how, what, what's your main method of correlation? Uh, also acknowledging the fact that radioisotopic dates aren't going to be available from many Gondwana basins because the ashes simply aren't there. What's your main basis for correlation and how are you sure that you're comparing like with like? Right. So actually, I didn't have time, of course, to in this talk to talk about it, but most of our work in the southern African basins, um, as well as in, so in southern uh, South America, has been in putting high precision dates and redating a lot of those basins, the Paraná, the uh, Paganzo, the Huaco, um, the Kalahari, the Karoo. Uh, and we have, um, we've actually published quite a series of papers on those where we've shown a lot of the original dates were way off, sometimes by 12 to 15 million years because they were based on um, laser ablation or sure. SIMS ages. And so what we've discovered, so, so yeah, so we've put a lot of ages on those. We've made those correlations for those basins. So West Central uh, Gondwana. But what that has done then is others have used that to re- evaluate the uh, palynology and their correlations there. I don't think anyone's applied that yet to the marine correlations, but um, it does show how provincial those the biostrategic 
stratigraphy can be in those high latitude basins. And I think we've contributed to a better understanding of that. And, that, and that's what we've been using. Um, okay. And sequence stratigraphy between it, because okay. um, it's allowing us to see those sequences. Okay, we have another question. Um, so br brilliant talk, thank you both. Uh, a slightly broader question based on your work on multi-million year timescales. Which key findings of, of your work do you think uh, could are uh, most applicable to contemporary timescales to inform future climate change policy mitigation. So in other words, you know, wh where are you going to help the kind of planners who are really thinking about sea level rise and temperature change uh, for our modern scenario of climate right. change, which we're all so worried about? Um, Sophie, do you mind if I take this? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I, I would say, you know, flat out, we're not directly informing, we can't. The boundary conditions are too different. The uncertainties and, and any component of this are too different. But that said, um, I've been, I, you know, I've been keen to invest this much time in this. Um, I also do Spiel with them work, which is much more recent. And the reason I have to say, I think this, this work is more interesting to me ultimately um, is because of all of the counterintuitive first order information we are, are learning. And, it, and that tells us something about um, our work that we can do much more higher precision, much higher resolution. Our models are not yet completely reproducing uh, what, you know, they're, they're keen, they're calibrated to the modern and they're, and they do really well, but it's still uncertain as to how they are, the physics of them or capturing everything. But the other thing that I think is important is it, regardless of the boundary conditions, regardless of the errors, there is still within that flexibility of the errors, there are clear large magnitude changes in everything. We see it in the reconstructed sea level. We see it in the reconstructed paleoclimates from made by different approaches. We see it in the plants. I mean, that's an un, you know, undisputed that, that that record is really well preserved. Big changes on glacial, interglacial and longer term under CO2 levels, that really, even if our uncertainties were 50%, aren't that different than today. And I think that's an eye-opening message. I think Ollie wanted to say something, is that right? Oh, um, no, I got my question. I was, I get unmasked myself as the triple isotope person. <laughs> so oh, that was my, was my question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You and Sophie should talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Well, uh, we don't have any more questions as far as I can see. So um, unless there's a, a, a sudden on, onslaught of questions, um, I think what we can say is thank you very much for, from Sophia and Isabel. I certainly enjoyed that talk. It was uh, really interesting to, uh, to look at the Permian Carboniferous, which I've been looking at for a long, long time from the point of view of modeling and seeing some of the new insights that you can get. So. I just wanted to say thank you to everybody. Uh, I tried to do a little bit of a round of applause <laughs> if people can't actually see me, but uh, I'm sure everybody's applauding that we can't see. So thank you very much, Isabel and, um, and Sophia. Um, uh, thanks again to the speakers and to everyone who's attended via Zoom and YouTube. Um, please check the website uh, and the webpage and Twitter feed to keep track of upcoming seminars. Um, I believe there isn't a next talk, is that right, Ollie? Uh, yeah, so what we're doing now is kind of transitioning to a, a pause and we'll probably be reaching out to everyone to get some feedback on a format that's going to um, be most useful for the kind of community going forward. Um, but we've got all the talks up on up on YouTube, so they're, they're there to look, look back over whilst we, whilst we decide next steps. But yeah, thanks to everyone that's tuned in over the course of the year. And thank you. And thank everyone. you for putting this together. It's, it's a great series. Yeah. Thanks very thank much, you, everyone. Eddie.